In this episode of Redacted, I'm sitting down with none other than Justin, aka Ron Raider, and we're going to talk about one of his really, really cool vulnerabilities that he found where he could have exploited a number of different financial institutions and gotten your credit card information. So that means if you're shopping online and you went on a trusted website or influencer website or even Justin's podcast and you entered your credit card number, he potentially could have hijacked it. And this again was available in a bunch of different platforms, including and we're going to get a live demo of it right now. Today, one of the nation's biggest banks has been hacked. Banking details may have been compromised in a recent data breach. Foreign adversaries and criminals will be looking to leverage the data. You just told me that you have hacked in this vulnerability and if you were to send this to your target or a list of targets, what you could have done eventually was just pull anyone's credit card information in plain text and just extract a bunch of credit card numbers. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, man. It's not not just though. Lots of uh, lots of payment providers are are vulnerable to this. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool bug that uses post messages and kind of abuses a, a data protection put in place to prevent credit card uh, data theft to do just that. So let's talk about post message itself. How does post message work? And I know post message is used across a lot of different products, like a lot of the bug bounty programs have been used it. Uh, how does it work? Why do people use it? You know, just explain a little bit if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. So post message is a way for two different tabs uh, or windows or frames to communicate um, inside the browser context. Uh, it's specifically used in cross origin scenarios where same origin policy would apply to prevent uh, these pages from communicating. So let's take a quick look at how that exactly would occur um, using the lab that we've got set up. First, before we go into this lab, I'm going to strongly recommend that you have Franz Rosen's post message tracker um, Chrome extension installed on your device. That will allow you to get a little bit more introspection into uh, the post messages that are being sent from window to window. And I'll make sure to link that down below in the description. So if you're looking for it, you can't find it. It'll be linked in the description down below. Let's go to the influence page and click the trusted store link button. Okay. And when we do, um, you'll, you'll go ahead and see a, a different tab being uh, popped up. And that tab is on the trusted website, which is different origin from the influence website. Uh, if we look at the source code for this page, then we can see that uh, a window open is being used right here. And the my pop-up variable is being assigned. This is a globally scoped variable. So we can uh, interact with this variable from our our console right here. And just to make it clear really quickly, this is a domain that you as an attacker control, right? It's not a it's not a part of the, the target website. This is your resource that you can put this page up. So for example, if Justin wanted to hack all of their listeners for their critical thinking bug bounty podcast, you could put that on the site, say check out here and this is pretty much how you could explode it too, right? Yeah, thanks for that, Ben. Uh, <laughs> now now all my listeners are gonna think I'm trying to steal their credit card information. Um, no, yeah, that's that's exactly right. This can be used in in uh, as an attack in most checkout contexts. Um, so definitely be looking at this when you're checking out uh, checkout pages. Look at that. When you're checking out no checkout pages. Intended. So we now can see that due to that window.open call, we have a variable called my pop-up, which is a window reference to this other trusted website tab. So let's go ahead and send a post message to this tab, and we can validate that we can receive it um, by opening up JavaScript console on this tab and uh, looking for the post messages coming through that are being displayed from Franz's post message tracker. So in order to do that, we'll do my pop-up dot post message. And I normally just say, you know, test one, two, three or something like that to, in order to validate the post message communication. And don't forget this star parameter at the end. Uh, this will say that this message is able to be sent to any origin. Um, and so whenever you're looking for post message related bugs, if this last parameter is being used to validate the origin, then uh, that's a security control that can be put in place. But us as attackers, we're normally going to be sending the star uh, string there. So if we go ahead and press send, 
we can see the post message being sent in the post message tracker on this page, and we can see the post message being received on this page. Now this is triggering an error on this page. So let's go ahead and look at the payments.js file where the process message and receive message functions are being defined. This is what's called a post message listener. And we can also see the presence of these post message listeners by going to the right hand side, clicking on global listeners and selecting the message category. From there, we can click the line of code that triggers the post message listener when a post message is sent. We can see that right here that that is line number 10, the function receive message. From here, we can start parsing out all the different possibilities. The first one is relay, and this is a particular function that will send the message that we received, E, and the data in that message, E.data, to the tab that opened this page right here. So window.opener is a variable that gets populated when a new tab is opened from a different tab in order to give the child tab a way to communicate with the tab that opened it. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit thick there. This will actually relay the data that's being sent back to the opener tab. This is a very important piece of the exploit and we'll cover this more later. The next function that's being called is the process message function. In this function, there is a JSON parse being done on the data passed through. There's some checks being done and then there's two different actions we can trigger, ready for client and payment created. We'll be exploiting the ready for client section of this function. One of the things I always like to do when assessing post message listeners is ensure that the code path that I'm working with is actually being run. Uh, in order to do that, I'll go ahead and select a breakpoint in the functions that I believe will be called. And I'll go ahead and try to trigger those breakpoints by sending a post message to the child page. As mentioned before, um, we can do that by using my pop-up.post message. And then if we navigate back to this page, we can see that a breakpoint has occurred on the relay function on line 11, and eventually will also be triggered on line 16, where the data is supposed to be parsed in JSON parse. This is sort of a sanity check that's really helpful because these functions can be really complicated. So make sure you're you're validating your, your code paths. That's a really good example and explanation of how post message works. But now let's talk about post message vulnerabilities in the context of this financial institution that you hacked into. All right, so with the vulnerability that I found, I stumbled upon a page that looked just like this with the checkout in place, with the card number and the expiration date. And when I reloaded this page, I noticed that there were being post messages sent from the parent frame here to the child frame where the actual inputs lived uh, on this page, okay? So the actual inputs where we put in our credit card number is isolated in a domain called payment. And that is isolated there because of data protection standards put in place by the government to control how various types of credit card information is processed and the environments in which uh, they're processed. But in this scenario, that's going to backfire on them. As I mentioned before, we can see when this page starts up that there is a configuration message that is being sent from top, that's the store, to the top dot frames zero, that's the credit card input frame. And if we look at this, we can see that there's a URL that's being defined. So let's go see how that URL is gonna be used. In order to do that, we'll open up the frame source and look at the JavaScript that is being used on that page. We can see that there is an event listener being defined here on line 122, where the JSON data is being parsed. And if the data dot event attribute is set to configure, this configure function is being run. So we can see the data that's being passed it here into the configure function is then being set to this variable process URL. And that process URL is then being used when the actual payment is occurring and the plain text credit card information is being sent to that URL. In other words, the URL that's being controlled via the post message is the same URL that the plain text data is being, credit card data is being sent to. That's a scary functionality to see. However, there's a, a function here called validate domain in place. This function is defined right here. Uh, and essentially what's, what's occurring is the URL is being dis, uh, assigned to a href, and then the host name of that domain is being extracted. The reason for this is that they are trying to validate what domain the data is being, going to be sent to. And we can see that that is being compared here on line 58 to a list of valid domains, which includes, which includes the process domain. So if they're validating the domain and they're looking for this process domain, how are you as an attacker able to inject yourself in there and be able to like steal this information? How is that possible if they have that in place? Yeah, to be honest, this looks like a pretty airtight validate domain function. However, there's one problem. 
After they do the validation here on line 104, they then proceed to add this caveat of if there is a URL encoded slash or percent %2f, they'll go ahead and URI decode the whole URL before setting it to the process URL. Anytime you see this sort of code flow where a validation occurs and then the validated data is then modified, you know that there's going to be a room for vulnerability there. So the entire exploitation chain here happens because they are looking for this URL encoded slash, the percent %2f. That's right. Something very innocuous like URL encoding can often get in the way in situations like this. So we're going to take advantage of this functionality and we're going to craft a URL which appears to the validate domain function to have the domain of the process domain that we have set up. But instead, when the URL decoding occurs, the actual domain will point to our attacker and controlled domain. So based on what you're telling me, this is this is not an open redirect, but if you're really good at finding open redirects, finding a bypass for this validation process, it should be pretty easy, right? Is that a dumb question? Is, is that a weird way to explain no, that? No, 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 no. It, it makes sense perfectly. So you're kind of applying uh, open redirect bypass logic here to the client side validation as well. To be clear, I'm not saying you need to look for an open redirect, but if you understand how to break open redirect logic, finding something like this is super easy. An open redirect will not work in this concept just because you have a, a post request and the request is being sent to a post method. So an open redirect wouldn't work, but if you understand how to break these parsers, then this would be mm. something really easy that you can uh, kind of uh, look for. This request is being sent using the post HTTP method, I think is probably what you want to say. All right, so I think everyone that's here, everyone that's been watching this video, they're waiting for this moment. What's the exploit? How did you exploit it? Show us, what's, what's the magic in this? All right, all right, before I show you the exploit, there's one last thing I need to show you, okay? So that is back here on the trusted store page. If we refresh this page, we can see that the first request or the first post message that's coming through is this ready for client post message that has a random ID inside of it, okay? In order for us to communicate with this page, the uh, the child frame, we need to have this trusted ID. We can see that that is validated over here on the payment page on line 128. So that ID has to match the ID that comes from this page. In order to get that ID, we're going to use that relay that I mentioned before. So let's go ahead and check out the final exploit now. Let's go ahead and click the link. We can see right off the bat that the first post message that comes through is this ready for client post message coming from the trusted website uh, page using the relay function found in payment.js. And the original origin of that post message comes from line 136 on the payment domain. So the actual domain where the credit card information is being inputted. So now that we've got that ID, let's go ahead and craft a payload that will allow us to bypass the validate domain function and inject our own malicious URL into the configuration settings. In order to do that, we can see here uh, on line 29 that we've defined a post message listener to respond to that ready client message that we received. We can see that we extract the ID and then we craft the correct JSON format required to interact with the payment page. The last thing that we needed to do was bypass the validate domain function with a URL that will be the process domain when passed in, into the validate domain function, but then will be an attacker control domain after URL decoded. In this scenario, we've crafted this URL right here. Okay, before we run this export, do me a favor quickly. I know on the screen right here, I see that you're showing, you're showing attacker.com percent five C and that's like a backslash. I also see the percent 23, which is like a hashtag sign. Okay, let's look at the URL. What does that look like before it's sent over and why does it work? Let's go ahead and look at how this URL ends up being processed here. So this is the URL that we're passing into the uh, configure function via post message, okay? And then the URL decoding occurs, which we can find here on line 106. When that occurs, the URL starts to look like this. In, and in this scenario, the domain has already been changed from process to attacker.com. And then from there, when this URL is actually passed into the fetch method, the backslash is converted into a forward slash, which makes this the primary URL that's being used to send the credit card data to. Yeah, that does make sense. But let's look at the export now. I want to see how you're going to steal the actual credit card data with this. All right, all right, let's check it out, okay? So if we press the trusted store link on influence, the influence domain, then we pop up this trusted store. The attack scenario here is that the malicious influencer is wanting to log the credit card information from uh, a trusted website like maybe shop.nahamsec.com. 
Um, so on this page, the victim will go ahead and put in their credit card information. And let's go ahead and open up the, the tab here so that we can see what that would look like when it's sent. And when we click the Make Payment button, you can see that the request is actually sending the data to attacker.com slash steal data, the domain that we hijacked via this malicious post message right here. In this scenario, the request to the attacker.com domain is failing because of Core's pre-flight requests. If this were a true attacker-controlled domain, then the attacker could simply log this data and pass through the result that the website is looking for, and this would be a seamless exploit that would go unnoticed by the user. So in reality, if someone were to exploit this, you have to kind of fish your target to go to a trusted site for it to work. But if you have someone like you or myself, have a, a lot of people that are in our network and we can forward them to that site, it's just going to be a lot easier to exploit it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Or another really um, scary attack scenario is if an influencer was compromised and this sort of script was uh, put in their website, this would allow for uh, a lot of credit card information to be stolen uh, without being noticed. So what do you think? Do you like these episodes of Redacted? Do you want me to bring more guests? If you want me to bring someone specific, do me a favor, drop me a comment. Let me know who you want to see next on an episode of Redacted. Peace.